Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, Conrad Adenauer Foundation, the Air Center, Civil Rights Defenders, for inviting me to this extremely interesting conference in a town of exceptional beauty. My intervention will focus on the role of the Venice Commission in defending judicial independence in general and in this region in particular. While this conference is mainly devoted to the role of the European Court of Human Rights and on its case law, the role of the Venice Commission is also of major importance and complementary to the role of the court. While the court deals with violations of human rights which have already occurred in the past, the role of the Venice Commission is mainly preventive. Typically, the Venice Commission is asked by the authorities of the country when drafting constitutions, amendments to the constitution or legislation to assist in the process. It provides opinions on draft legislation quickly and following discussions with all stakeholders. In its opinions, it examines whether the drafts proposed are in line with international standards and whether the solutions chosen seem appropriate for the situation based on the experience also of other countries. Obviously, the main, if not the main, criterion for the Venice Commission is compatibility with the European Convention of Human Rights and the case law of the court. This is not always an easy task since the Commission often has to address issues not yet examined by the court and has to anticipate what the court may say in a given situation. In practice, the positions taken by the Venice Commission have generally been confirmed by the court in its judgments and the court frequently quotes the opinions and reports of the Venice Commission. However, the Venice Commission is freer in its approach. We, uh, are, we do not necessarily base our recommendations only on what is required by the European Convention of Human Rights, but can also base them on other international standards and the experience of other countries, since these are recommendations, it's not hard law. Our opinions are advisory and not legally binding. However, their authority in the, in the region and in Europe in general is very high. Other Council of Europe organs, such as the Parliamentary Assembly, regularly refer to them. Candidate states for membership in the European Union and potential candidate states are conscious that the European Union relies very much on the opinions of the Venice Commission in the relevant fields in order to determine whether national legislation is in line with European standards. If the Venice Commission has given a negative opinion, the respective legislation is likely to be contested by the European Union. On the other hand, if the opinion of the Venice Commission is positive, the country is fairly safe that the EU will not later challenge the legislation. For the European Union, it's quite logical to rely on the Council of your body, such as the Venice Commission, since the European standards in the area of the rule of law have been developed within the Council of Europe and not within the European Union. It is also politically convenient for the European Commission to rely on the opinions of a neutral technical body, such as the Venice Commission, instead of assuming responsibility itself. On the other hand, the Venice Commission will always remain consistent in its approach and we will not criticize legislation simply because the respective government is badly seen by the EU or will not approve legislation since the respective authorities are in the good books of the European Commission. The importance of the issue of judicial independence and impartiality in Europe at present is obvious and has already been pointed out by many other speakers. It is also very much the focus of the recent work of the Venice Commission. At present, the Venice Commission is discussing with the Serbian authorities the possible reform of the Serbian constitution in the field of the judiciary. This year, it adopted opinions on the reform of the prosecution service in Montenegro and the reform of the higher judicial and prosecutorial council in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In recent years, it was closely involved in judicial reforms in North Macedonia and Albania. 
The Venice Commission not only provides opinions on specific pieces of legislation, but also adopts reports and studies of a general nature. With respect to the topic of this conference, I would refer in particular to the report on the independence of the judicial system, part one, the judiciary, and part two, the prosecution service of 2010, the report on judicial appointments of 2007, and the rule of law checklist of 2016. These reports sum up the previous practice of the Commission and provide guidance for its future work. They thus ensure the consistency of the approach of the Commission. However, they take into account the diversity of the judicial system in Europe, leaving sufficient flexibility to find solutions appropriate for the specific situation and the tradition of each country. There can be no one-size-fits-all model of judicial organization. But while the means may differ, all the solutions have to achieve the end result of ensuring judicial independence. Obviously, these reports also integrate the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, as well as other European and international standards. In this respect, I would refer in particular to the opinions of the Consultative Council of European Judges, another Council of your body, which strongly influenced the report on the independence of judges and the recommendation to 2010-12 of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe on judges, independence, efficiency and responsibilities. You will find all the reports as well as the opinions on specific countries on the website of the Commission. I will not try to cover all aspects of these reports, but only flag some issues which seem to me of particular importance for Southeast Europe. The Venice Commission has always strongly underlined the importance not only of the external independence of the judiciary with respect to outside bodies, such as the executive and parliament, but also of the internal independence of each individual judge. The judiciary is not a hierarchy where the court president gives instructions to the judges of his or her court, or where the Supreme Court provides instructions to the other courts. Each individual judge decides independently on the basis of his or her interpretation of the law. But of course, judges may not decide arbitrarily according to their personal whim, but they have to take into account the case law of the other courts, and in particular, the superior courts. Internal and external independence are linked. Since the political organs may try to use court precedents to influence the decision-making of this respective court. Another possible means for court precedents or procedures to influence decision-making is the allocation of cases. There is a risk that politically sensitive cases are given to judges considered loyal by the government. To avoid this risk, many European constitutions provide the right to a lawful judge requiring that it should be determined in advance on the basis of objective criteria which judge or chamber will comp be competent for the case. The Venice Commission as well recommends that the allocation of cases should be based on objective and transparent criteria established in advance. The importance of this issue is demonstrated by the fact that in some countries where such systems were introduced in principle, there is a possibility to make ad hoc exceptions and this possibility is used in sensitive cases. The crucial institution to protect the independence of the judiciary is the Judicial Council. Such councils do not traditionally exist in all Western European countries. The Venice Commission recommends, however, that those countries not having done so should consider establishing such bodies and a number of West European countries have done so in recent years although often with fairly limited powers. In new democracies, judicial councils seem indispensable and all Central and, European, and Eastern European countries have established such an institution. Such bodies can be effective only if their composition guarantees that they are not dominated by the executive and by the parliamentary majority. Their composition has to be pluralistic and the judges themselves have to be a key component. The Venice Commission initially recommended that a substantial element, if not the majority 
of the members should be judged elected by their peers. I want to put the accent here on elected by their peers. It's not so important that the members are judges, since some judges may be loyal to the government, but it is important that they are judges elected by their colleagues. Subsequently, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe adopted its recommendation 2010-12, according to which not less than half the members of such councils should be judges chosen by their peers from all levels of the judiciary in the respect for pluralism within the judiciary. Since then, the Venice Commission recommends to states to comply with the recommendation, which has not been implemented by a considerable number of Council of Europe member states. The Venice Commission, however, also continues to advocate a pluralistic composition of judicial councils, including a considerable number of non-judges, in order to ensure the, the accountability of the judiciary to society. Some of these other members may be elected by Parliament, but should not be members of Parliament. It has be, to be ensured that these members do not only represent the parliamentary majority, but also the opposition. In Southeast Europe, this may be difficult, since boycotts of Parliament by the opposition are unfortunately quite frequent. There may also be representatives of the bar, although their conflicts of interest have to be avoided, of law faculties, or of NGOs, the question being which NGO to select. There may also be ex officio members, such as the President of the Supreme Court. It is not a priori excluded that the Minister of Justice may be a member of the Council, but he or she should not take part in decisions in disciplinary proceedings. Thus, there is no single model of the composition of a Judicial Council, but each country has to find a solution best suited to the specific circumstances. A Judicial Council can protect the independence of the judiciary only if it has sufficient powers. It should have a decisive influence on decisions on the appointment and career of judges. Judges may be formally appointed by the Head of State, but this should be done upon the recommendation of the Judicial Council. The Venice Commission does not regard Judicial Councils as equivalent to an independent court and recommends that there should be a possibility to appeal the decisions of these councils to an independent court. Therefore, these decisions have also to be motivated since otherwise there can be no judicial control of the decisions of the council. The most important and basic guarantee of judicial independence is, of course, the principle of irremovability, tenure until retirement. The Venice Commission considers probationary periods for judges to be problematic from the point of view of independence. Obviously, judges may be removed from office following disciplinary proceedings, and there may also be exceptional situations when disciplinary proceedings are not sufficient and the general vetting of judges may be justified. One such situation is following a revolution and the overthrow of a, an authoritarian regime. If the judiciary is strongly compromised with the previous regime, the general vetting of sitting judges with a view confirm, to confirming only some of them in office may be justified subject to sufficient safeguards. Fortunately, this issue seems no longer relevant for Southeast Europe. Another such situation is widespread corruption within the judiciary, which goes beyond what can be handled by disciplinary procedures. Corrupt judges, as President Spano pointed out yesterday, are neither independent nor impartial. In Albania, corruption within the judiciary was so widespread that society had completely lost trust in the judicial system. The Venice Commission therefore accepted the general vetting of the sitting judges with a clear constitutional basis and international participation subject to sufficient procedural guarantees. In conclusion, it is clear that judicial independence does not depend on legal and constitution, constitutional rules alone, but also on the legal and political culture of the country concerned. However, without good and precise rules, judicial independence cannot be preserved in countries without a long tradition of the rule of law. 
politicians will always be tempted to interfere with the judiciary to further their own interests or the interests of their friends. Both society and international institutions have to remain vigilant in this respect. Judges are not able to defend their independence alone, but they can contribute to making attacks against their independence more difficult by carrying out their tasks without reproach, thus depriving politicians of pretext to attack the judiciary as independent and incompetent, politically compromised or corrupt. Unfortunately, however, the situation in Poland has shown that some politicians will be ready to undermine the independence of the judiciary, even if on the whole the judiciary functions well. In such situations, international bodies such as the European Court of Human Rights, the Venice Commission, and for EU member states, the European Commission and the European Court of Justice have to play a major role in defending judicial independence. Thank you very much for your attention.